So now that we know how to use elementary row operations on an augmented matrix to discover the row echelon form of a linear system of equations, identify the pivots, and use that data to discover the parametric description of the solution set of that linear system, which is the most important computational process of our entire semester. It's going to be a common theme for us. Now that we're comfortable with that process, now we need to begin to unpack what it all actually means to begin to put linear algebra into its conceptual context that's going to reveal why it's way more powerful than just a set of techniques for finding solutions of linear systems of equations. In other words, we want to begin the process of stepping back from the work that we're doing and understanding what this work actually means in a larger theoretical concept, uh, construct of mathematics. So with that technique under our belt, I first want to begin by asking the following questions. Once we row reduce a linear system of equations, discover the pivots, find a description for its parametric solution set, what have we actually learned from that process about, for example, what is the number of variables in the system that we just solved, actually kind of telling us theoretically as a mathematical construct? What is the number of equations that participated in that system actually telling us in a broader sense about mathematical ideas? Um, and perhaps most importantly, what does the number of pivots in a linear system of equations actually tell us about the nature of that linear system? And in particular, what is it telling us about the nature of the variables that participated in that system, the equations which determined that system, and most importantly, what is it telling us about what the solution set of that system actually looks like? So we're going to work in these next couple of videos at building out our geometric intuition for what solutions of linear systems of equations actually look like. So let's start by thinking about, first of all, the number of variables that participate in a linear system. If I'm going to find a solution to that system, what I'm really trying to do is supply information about all of the variables in that system. And so, in a way, the number of variables gives me a sense of the, the space, the dimension, in which the solutions of my linear system are going to reside. Dimension is a word that's going to be super important for us in linear algebra that we're not ready yet to define on a rigorous basis. But we can sort of understand it in some small cases um, based on our previous experience with analytic geometry. For example, if I have a linear system of two equations, uh, uh, sorry, let's say two unknowns, x and y, so there's two variables that I want to solve for then what we can do is we can think of the values of those two variables, and each of those values is going to be a real number, as determining via an ordered pair a point inside of the Cartesian xy plane, the plane in which we usually do our graphing in algebra, right? Uh, where the x value is determined by that point's distance, uh, orthogonal distance from the y-axis, and the y-coordinate is determined by the orthogonal distance from the x-axis. And so that's a pretty familiar setting for us in analytic geometry because at this point we've done plenty of algebra and calculus that resides, graphically at least, inside of the xy plane. All right, so what if we add a variable? What if I'm looking at a linear system of equations with three variables? Let's call them x, y, and z. Well, then what I have is I have one additional variable, z, that's going to give me a new, what we might think of as a new degree of freedom in where my solution set can live. So if my old system resided on the xy plane, where x and y determine a point on a two-dimensional space, like the xy plane, then adding a z adds a third dimension that's going to broaden the, the space in which my solutions are going to live. So we're going to think of a solution of a linear system of three variables as residing inside of xyz space, where we have sort of three degrees of freedom, three dimensions uh, along which to, to go. Right? Uh, so in the Cartesian xyz space, we think of the coordinates of a point x, y, and z as measuring the distances to the respective coordinate planes. So the x-coordinate measures the distance of that point to the yz plane, where x is equal to 0. And then y and z are determined uh, in a similar fashion. For us in linear algebra, we're almost always going to use rectangular coordinates. Rectangular coordinates are the coordinate system that describes for us uh, how to measure the location of a point by looking at its orthogonal distance to the coordinate planes. 
one of the things we'll do later on in the semester is look at how to change coordinates a little bit, but they'll always be in linear fashion. So we're not going to look at curvilinear coordinates like cylindrical or spherical or other coordinate systems that you might have seen um, in a calculus course. Those are not really going to be a part of our, of our existence this semester. We're going to stick to the, the rectangular coordinate basis. So the number of variables tells me how big my solution space is. Uh, my solutions will live in two dimensions if I have two variables. My solutions are going to live in three dimensions if I have three variables. Well, what if I have four variables, x, y, z, and w? Well, then my solutions are going to live in a four-dimensional space. How do I draw a four-dimensional space? I, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to cross that bridge this semester. Um, but I will tell you that the intuition that I have, and when I think about a four-dimensional system, or a 10-dimensional system, or a 27-dimensional system, as a mathematician, the intuition, the picture that I see in my mind's eye, I tend to revert to just thinking of them all as looking like three dimensions, just so that I have a, a useful mental frame uh, for what things look like. So I'm not going to endeavor to draw any, any dimensions higher than three. Uh, you can if you want to, but we won't have to. So if that's what the number of variables tells me, what about the number of equations? Well, each equation that I write down is putting what's sometimes called a constraint on the three variables. Geometrically, what a linear equation, now that we know what linear equations look like, what a linear equation looks like as a subset of the space in which it resides is it looks like an object that we call in mathematics a hyperplane. And when I say the word hyperplane, what I mean is a linear-like object, so it might look flat or straight if we were to visualize it in our mind's eye, um, whose dimension is one less than the dimension of the space that surrounds it. So we'll look at a couple examples in a second. Each equation that I write down is going to determine one of those hyperplanes. And if I have multiple equations that all must be satisfied, then the solution of the system is the intersection of all of those hyperplanes that correspond to the equations that I wrote down. So each equation that I write down determines a hyperplane, and the intersection of all those hyperplanes determines my solution set. So supposing that I have two variables for the moment, that means that my solution set is going to live in a two-dimensional space, like the xy plane. And let's say that I only have one equation. So I write down one equation. It's going to give me one constraint on the variables x and y. So one thing that the equations x and y have to satisfy. And we have seen that a linear equation in two variables, when we graph it in the xy plane, is going to look like a straight line. If the right-hand side of that equation is not 0, that line is not going to pass through the origin. If it is 0, the line will pass through the origin, but it's going to be a straight line nevertheless. And remember, we're using the word hyperplane to describe this, because hyperplane means one dimension less than the space that surrounds it. So in two dimensions, a hyperplane is a one-dimensional object, i.e. a line. So two variables, one equation, that determines only a single hyperplane, a single line, and that line is therefore the solution set. We don't have anything else to intersect it with, so that whole line is going to be the solution set of that system. There's no way around it. OK, what if I have three variables and two equations? Well, the fact that I have three variables means that my solution set has to live inside of a three-dimensional space, xyz space. And my two equations each are going to define for me a hyperplane in three space. And in three-dimensional space, a hyperplane means a two-dimensional object, which is going to look like a plane, so what we often just call a regular plane two-dimensional plane sitting inside of three dimensions. So one possibility for what my solution set will look like, depending on how those planes are arranged inside of three space, is that if those two planes happen to intersect one another, as they do in my picture here, then the intersection of those two planes is going to determine for me a line. And that line is going to be the solution set of the system. Right? So this is the theoretical framework that we have so far that the number of variables that we have to work with in a system tell me the dimension of the space in which my solution set is going to live, and the number of equations tells me the number of hyperplanes that I'm going to try to intersect in order to form the solution set of that system. So our next goal is then going to be to figure out what does the number of pivots in a linear system of equations tell us. And the number of pivots is more of a challenge to determine because that depends on all of the qualities that that system has. It depends on more than just the number of variables, more than just the number of equations. The number of pivots is something we can only discover after finding a row echelon form for our matrix to really kind of unveil its true colors, in a sense. So in our next video, we're going to take a closer look at what the number of pivots in a linear system tell us about the nature of the solution set.
to that system.